We've just seen what it means to be ignorant. But to do practical cryptography, we have to consider what it means to be almost ignorant. Perf perfection is essentially impossible to attain in practice. Errors are unavoidable in the real world, meaning that we will never end up exactly with the state that we wanted. Any real protocol has a finite amount of communication. We will also perform tests on what the adversary has done, meaning that we will only gain some confidence about the behavior, but we will never know perfectly whether the adversary is really completely ignorant. We will see many examples where we cannot show that our protocol achieves this utopian ideal that Eve is completely ignorant about the key. This means that we need a measure of being approximately ignorant. Let's consider the real versus the ideal scenario more closely. In the ideal one, our attacker starts with some system, which I'll call EIN, and say Alice starts with some system, which I'll call AIN. We run the protocol with some communication back and forth, and during this protocol, Eve might gain some information. Let me call her information at the very end of the protocol, E. Alice might produce a key, which we will call K. And in the ideal scenario, we would have managed to end up exactly in a situation which is precisely what we wanted. Eve is ignorant about the key. Now, in any real protocol, things are typically not as beautiful as in the ideal case. We will run a real protocol and we will end up with some real state. Now, we want our real protocol to nevertheless be sort of useful and good. So we would want that the real state is somehow close to the ideal state. What I want to discuss with you now is what do we mean by close? To define a useful measure of closeness, we will think about distinguishing states, namely the real and the ideal state. To find a good measure, let's first consider a small game. Imagine that I prepare the system KE by either running the ideal protocol, the magic protocol, that produces exactly the state that I want, or I run the real protocol, where there's some imperfections, meaning that at the end the state row will just be row real, hopefully close to the ideal one. Let's say that you have actually no idea whether I used the ideal or the real protocol. For purpose of illustration, let me assume that I choose to run the real one with probability half and the ideal one also with probability half. So we're now in a situation where the combined system Ke is with probability half in the ideal state and probability half in the real state. My challenge to you now is to tell me do we have the real or the ideal state? Given that you've already heard something about quantum information, you might want to stop this video and think for a minute on what we might do to K and E to figure out whether we have the real or the ideal state. What we will do, of course, is to make a measurement. And this measurement will have two outcomes, real and ideal. So in terms of measurement operators, I will call one of them real, so for real outcome, and M, ideal. And we know if I make a P of M, that these two will just add up to the identity. So let me now write down the probability that you manage to distinguish these two scenarios. 
and I can write it down as follows. With probability half, I've prepared the ideal state. And this here is the probability that given the state is ideal, you correctly identify it. With probability half, I run the real protocol to prepare the real state. And in this case, this is the probability that given the state was real, you correctly identify it as such. So this is the probability of distinguishing the real from the ideal. Let me just rephrase this by saying that m real and m ideal add up to the identity. So what I've done here is I've taken m real and I've replaced it by the identity minus m ideal coming from here. Let me reshuffle this a bit. So what I have is I have a half out front. This comes from here, a half, times the trace of rho. Remember that the trace of rho is 1. And what do I have here? I have a half. This here I've just carried over. And now I have here minus m ideal times the rho real. So I put m ideal in front and I put the minus here. So this is the expression that we get. So we're talking about distinguishing states. And the idea now behind the nice measure of closeness is that we will call two states close if they are difficult to distinguish. So let's define a distance measure that is precisely aimed at capturing this idea. Here I have again written the distinguishing probability. And of course, being very smart, you might say that you want to find the best measurement to distinguish the two states. So we're going to optimize here over all measurement operators m ideal. So we know that p of m operators are positive. And we also know that if I add this one plus m real, I must get the identity. So this is also true. So what this means is that this here is positive semi-definite, meaning that the largest eigenvalue of n is also not larger than 1. So we maximize this expression over all possible measurement operators m ideal. This gives us a quantity which we will call the trace distance. The trace distance between two states, rho 1 and rho 2, here ideal and real, is defined as the trace of m times rho 1 minus rho 2. And m is a measurement operator, a pure m element. You can see now that if the trace distance is small, then it means that it is difficult to distinguish these two states. And because we are maximizing, it means that it's difficult to distinguish rho 1 and rho 2 using any allowed measurement. In particular, any measurement allowed by nature that might be arbitrarily complicated. We might even need a quantum computer to realize these measurements. We will also call two states, rho 1 and rho 2, epsilon close which I will write like this, if the trace distance between them is less than epsilon. So we've seen now that the trace distance is quite intuitive. Two states are close if they are difficult to distinguish. Why is the trace distance so useful for cryptography? There might be all other kinds of measures of closeness. Remember that we are never trying to use protocols in isolation. We are always in a scenario where we usually embed a protocol in a larger context. For example, we might have a larger protocol that actually wants to use keys that Eve is ignorant about. For example, in the one-time pad, we needed such keys. If we have a real protocol, that produces, say, a real state Ke, this is very difficult to analyze now what happens to the one-time pad. 
we may not even know exactly what the state is. We've done some tests, we've done some gains of confidence, but there's essentially no situation where we will be able to say exactly what the state looks like. So how can we even analyze this huge protocol, given this somewhat unknown real state? The idea is now to say that instead of analyzing the surrounding protocol, for example, the one-time pad, using the real state, we will replace the real state by the ideal state. And we will perform the analysis as if we had the real state, as if Eve was completely ignorant about the key. Now, of course, if we actually have the real scenario, but we analyze it as if we were in the ideal setting, we might make an error. But the point is now that if the real state is close to the ideal one, then any measurement, there's no measurement that can tell the difference between real and ideal very well. In particular, it also means that any measurement, also ones that consist of, for example, using the one-time pad followed by another measurement, can hardly see a difference. So if we use the real state instead of the ideal state in a larger context, it means that we will not be able to see the difference. So this is why the trace distance is so extremely important in cryptography. Before we conclude, let me give you some useful properties of the trace distance. The trace distance is called a distance. Mathematically, it is a metric. And it means that it behaves pretty much like distances that you're used to in the real world. Let's consider here three cities in the Netherlands. Delft, where I am right now, Leiden and Amsterdam. As you might guess, a distance is always positive. If I walk somewhere, I have to cover some ground. And indeed, the trace distance is always positive. A distance to somewhere is zero only if I'm at the same point. In terms of the trace distance, it means that the trace distance is zero if and only if the two states are the same. The trace distance is also symmetric. If I walk from Amsterdam to Delft, then it's the same distance as if I walk from Delft to Amsterdam. Or the trace distance between row n, row 1 and row 2, is the same as the trace distance between row 2 and row 1. Finally, the trace distance satisfies the triangle inequality. The triangle inequality captures the intuitive notion of distance that if I were to walk from Delft to Amsterdam, or from row 1 to row 2, or if I first walk from Delft to Leiden, from row 1 to row 3, and then onwards from Leiden to Amsterdam, we certainly have that the distance between Delft and Amsterdam is not larger than if I walk by a Leiden, meaning the distance between Delft and Leiden and Leiden and Amsterdam. We've seen now a very important measure, the trace distance, and it quantifies what it means to be almost ignorant. We can consider the trace distance to the perfect ideal case where Eve is ignorant.